The following sermon is from Al Rudy, Senior Pastor at Faith Baptist Church in Danville, Illinois. If you've never reached out to Faith before, we'd like to hear from you. Visit our website, faithdanville.org. That's faithdanville.org. And now, here's Pastor Rudy. Let's go to Matthew 15 in our Bibles this morning. As I said, we'll take a break just from this uh, one Sunday from Daniel. And on this Mother's Day, we want to preach a message entitled, uh, Not Too Proud to Beg. Years ago, uh, there was a letter-writing campaign and organized by a lady by the name of Anna Jarvis, and it had a purpose to give special attention to mothers. And uh, so because of all that, on May the 9th, 1914, the president, Woodrow Wilson, proclaimed the second Sunday of May, National Mother's Day, as a public expression of love and reverence for the mothers of our country. And that was started again back in 1914. It's been going on ever since, and it's a good day. The late evangelist D.L. Moody once declared, all that I've ever accomplished in my life I owe to my mother. That was D.L. Moody. James Garfield uh, was elected the 20th president of the United States back in November of 1880. His first act that day after being inaugurated president of this country was to stoop down and kiss his aged mother who sat nearby him. I like that little poem that says, uh, they say that man is mighty, he governs land and sea, he wields a mighty scepter on lower powers than he, but mightier power and stronger, man from his throne is hurled, for the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. Uh, I, I think about that time a preacher wanted to express the meaning of his mother with an acrostic. He said that M is for the million things she gave me, O means only that she's growing old, T is for the tears she shed to save me. H is for her heart of purest gold. E is for her eyes with love light shining. R means right and right shall always be. Put them all together and they spell mother. A world, a word that means the world to me. This morning we're in a text here that tells us the story of a mother who had a very desperate desire for her daughter. And this story just shows a mother who wasn't too proud to beg the Lord and for, in order to get the help she needed for her child. And this mom provides the key to every mother, really to every person here today. If you have a need, um, then I believe you can see yourself in this mother here. And, and so if you and I have a need and a desire to have that need met, then, just like this mom, when you come to Jesus, you should never be too proud to beg. And he's always there to help us. Now, by way of outline, I want us to notice here today, a bur- first of all, a burdened mother's complication. We're going to start there in this text in Matthew 15. And uh, so we're going to start out there in verse number 21, where it says that Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. Behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed, that means possessed, with a devil. Many Christians are familiar with the life of St. Augustine. He was one of Christianity's most brilliant theologians. What many don't know, though, is that when he was young, Aurelius Augustine lived a very wicked and immoral life before he got saved. And for more than 30 years, his mom, a lady by the name of Monica, prayed for him to get saved. And he grew up, got out of the home, but she just followed him wherever he went. He went to Carthage, she followed him there, to Rome, over to Milan. And and every time she followed him, she would weep and plead and pray to the God of heaven for her son's soul. Monica once said that her burden was for her son that she carried was almost too much for her to bear. But in time, God answered her prayer and saved him. Now, the mother in our story this morning was carrying a very similar burden in her heart for one of her children. And... And even though she was burdened, she was faced with some very serious complications. For for starters, she was, number one, logistically outcast. That's how I would put this. In verse 21, we started that verse out by looking at those words, she was a woman of Canaan. Now, we just finished a series on Sunday nights in the book of Joshua. And from that study of the book, we learned that the Canaanites were not a friendly acquaintance of Israel. In fact, they were one of their uh, greatest enemies. From the very beginning of their existence, the Canaanites were a cursed people. Noah's son, one of his sons by the name of Ham, was the father of the Canaanites. And he was given a harsh rebuke by God in Genesis 9, when God said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. 
Now, that, that started back there, way back there in Genesis. It carried over into the, from, into the years. And, and then when Israel was getting ready to take possession of the promised land, the Canaanites were one of the last obstacles to be overtaken in order for Israel to come in and claim their land. The last Old Testament prophecy concerning the Canaanites is found in Zechariah, the last book of the Old Testament, chapter 14 and verse 21, where it says they were excluded from the future house of the Lord. This passage in front of us today in Matthew 15 is really the only place you're going to find any reference to Canaan in the entire New Testament. So the simple truth is, as a woman of Canaan, this woman was a logistical outcast. What I mean by that is she did not belong to the people of God. She was an outsider, and you know we would prefer today as someone who came from the wrong side of the railroad tracks. And I mean, she was a pagan Gentile, and to make matters worse, she was a Canaanite. That meant she was a heathen idolater whose worship consisted of false gods like Baal and Ashtaroth. And so she was logistically outcast, but not only that, she was spiritually downcast. Now, up to this point in the life and ministry of our Lord, it would have been shocking for a Jew to cry out to Jesus, okay? Um, Not many were getting saved in those early days, Jews, I should say, but for a Gentile to cry out to Jesus for help, that would have been almost uh, impossible. It just was very rare. For one thing, the worship of her false gods forbade her to worship the one true and living God of heaven. So for this woman to cry out to the Son of God, Jesus, would have been considered an act of treason by her people, the Canaanites. And yet here we see this woman, she's logistically outcast, and and, uh, she's crying out to Jesus because she was spiritually downcast. Look at those words again. It says that she was was, uh, crying unto him saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed or possessed with a demon. That word cry there comes from a Greek word, cry with God's own. It simply applies much more than just a, a, a shallow, low whimpering. The word actually suggests wailing. We use the terms weeping and wailing. That's what she was doing. She was weeping and wailing and crying out to Jesus, probably at the top of her lungs, because here's a loving mother who has a daughter who's been demon-possessed. I mean, we can't imagine how bad that would have been. So while it was rare for a Jew to approach the Lord in this matter, here comes this pagan, idolatrous, Canaanite woman who is interceding for her daughter. And we need to understand what's really going on here, folks. I mean, here's this woman. She is literally turning her back on the gods of her people. And she's openly confessing her faith in the only true God she knew could help her daughter. And then that the way it usually goes out there in the world. I mean, the world has its own gods. And, and uh, they, as long as things are going okay, I mean, they're going to keep worshiping those, those gods that they have. But when things go wrong, now what do you do? And that's what's happening here with this woman. I mean, she, she uh, had a trust in a pagan god like Baal. That might have been fine as long as things were going well. But when her daughter became possessed by a demon, she knew that she could not get any help at all from that false god of stone. She knew that. So she's leaving behind a religious system. Her her false beliefs that had no answers for her, that had no power to deliver her, her daughter. And so she comes to the only one who can help her. I like what one Bible commentator said here. He said she was a Gentile woman who disregarded historical animosity, cultural taboos, and racial differences for the sake of her daughter. He said it made her an outsider, an oddball to her own people, but it was worthwhile for her daughter's sake. And it was so true. Everything she believed, it didn't matter now. She needed to get help for her daughter. You know, in one sense, this woman pictures our spiritual condition really, as Gentiles before we got saved. There was a day when we were the same way. We were logistically outcast and we were spiritually downcast. We can get that from what Paul said in Ephesians 2 and verse 12 when he described our lost condition. Paul wrote there that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. Now get this. Having no hope and without God in this world. That's where we were before we got saved, folks. 
We were aliens. We were strangers from God and his people. We were logistically outcasts. We had no hope. We were without God. We were spiritually downcast. We were not God's friend. We were God's enemy because of our sin. We had no right to draw near to God or to pray to God. And, and, and so we had no hope. And we had no Savior. We had no God. We were without him in this world. But thank the Lord, there came a day when just like this woman, in utter desperation, we realized that we could not save ourselves. No one else could save us. A church couldn't save us. Only Jesus could. So he cried out to the Lord Jesus for his mercy and his grace, not on the basis of who we were, but on the basis of who he was. God, not only that day when we trusted Jesus, withheld what we deserve, which was judgment, but he gave us what we did not deserve, and that was salvation. He saw that faith in our heart, that moment we were trusting Jesus to save us, and God saved our soul. And so here was this woman who, for the sake of her child, makes her daughter's case, her very own. I mean, think about it. She was willing to turn her back on the only God she had ever known and worshipped in order to turn to the one true God of heaven that she must know if her daughter was going to be healed. Now, as a, as a Gentile Canaanite, the odds were not in this woman's favor. She was confronted with some, some serious complications and obstacles to get what her daughter needed for her soul. And so that's the first thing we see. Now as we move on, I want us to notice the second thing here. And that would be this, a broken mother's frustration. So she's got this burden because of her complications, but now she's broken and she's frustrated. Knowing the heart of our Lord, it would seem that the wailing cry of this desperate mother would immediately turn things in her favor, but that isn't what happened here. And there was a reason for it. We're going to see as we get into this. Not only was she burdened with complications, but now she is broken hearted and she's filled with frustration. And I want you to see why. Okay, let's take a look at this. For one thing, number one, she had to deal with the fact of being rejected. Now that's never any fun, is it? To be rejected. I mean, here she had risked everything in order to come to Jesus for help. She's turned her back on all those other family members, her friends, even her, her so-called faith in those false gods. And yet notice the response she gets here in verse 23. Look at it. It says here, but he, Jesus, answered her not a word. So she's pouring her heart out to the only one who can help her, only to receive no response from him at all. Now, you think Jesus could have said no, right? But instead, he doesn't say anything. Now, he's got something he's going to do here. He knows he's going to do. But at this moment, um, she's kind of like getting the silent treatment, or so it appears, from the Son of God. One Bible commentator wrote about this. The hardest response to accept is no response at all. In the case of this woman, the word had no word. The great physician holds back his remedy. Now, I want you to think about this this morning. Has there ever been a time when you felt this same way, when you went to God in prayer, there was a heavy burden on you, and, and you brought this to the Lord, and, and you had this, whole, this terrible, heavy, laden burden, and you, you were ready to pour out your heart and soul to the Lord, and then you were like, it seemed like those prayers were like reaching that ceiling before they bounced right back at you. Ever had anything like that? Well, I think all of us have been there at some point in our life. And God was doing something there, but we didn't know it at the very moment. We did in time. But that's the way it goes sometimes. We pray out, out the Lord, and it doesn't seem like we're, we're getting any answer, and the Lord doesn't seem to be listening or hearing. And, and, of course, he always is. But it does remind me of that little boy. He, he strolled into the kitchen one day where his mom was making dinner for him, and, and his sixth birthday was coming up. And he thought it was a good time to tell his mom what he wanted for his birthday. So he said, Mom, I sure would like a bike for my birthday. And now, he was getting in trouble at school all the time. At school, at church, at home. And so his mom suggested that he write a letter to God and tell him why he thought he deserved a bike for his birthday. And so the little boy wrote, Dear God, I have been a very good boy this year, and I would like a bike for my birthday. I'd like a red one. And signed, Your Friend Billy. Well, a week went by, and Billy got no answer because there was no bike. So he tore up the first letter, wrote a second one. Dear God, I've been an okay boy this year. 
I still would really like a red bike for my birthday, your friend Billy. Well, another week went by, still no answer, still no red bike. Billy tore up the previous letter and wrote a third one. Dear God, I know I haven't been a very good boy this year. I am very sorry for that. I will be a good boy for you if you just send me a red bike. Thanks, Billy. Another week went by. Still no answer. By this time, the little boy was upset. He was frustrated. He walked down the street to the church on the corner. He opened the door slowly, crept down to the altar at the front. He looked around to make sure nobody was watching, and and then he picked up a little statue of the Virgin Mary, slipped it under his coat, ran out the door, down the street, up into his house, up to his room, shut the door behind him and sat down and wrote his final letter to God. Dear God, I've got your mama. If you want to see her again, send that red bike now. (laughs) Signed, you know who. (laughs) Now, I wouldn't recommend that tactic. (laughs) If your prayers aren't being heard, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't, you know, that, that wouldn't get you much anywhere, obviously. But here's the thing. Anyone who's ever spent time with God in prayer knows what it's like to be given what seems like having silent treatment. You're praying, and not only don't you get an answer, you don't seem like your prayer's getting anywhere. And, uh, and, then, and so that was an obstacle this woman was faced with. But there was another obstacle she had to face, and that was this, the fear of being removed. So there's this fact of being rejected, or at least it looked that way. Now you've got a fear of being removed. Look what happens here. She's crying out to Jesus in intercession for her daughter, doesn't get any response. And then to make matters worse, the first thing she does here is that some want to get her out of the way. Look again at verse 23. It says here, and his disciples came and besought him, besought Jesus, saying, send her away, for she crieth after us. Now the word besought right here, comes from a Greek word, erotao. That word was used in many different ways in the New Testament. The word was often used to mean the idea of to to interrogate or to question or to entreat. This particular word in this verse literally means to beg or to urge or to plead. So it does appear that this woman had gotten on the disciples' nerves, okay? Okay. And the disciples were flesh and blood just like we are. They could get upset, get riled up, and that's what was going on right here. It had reached the point where they could not take this woman crying out anymore. And so they're literally begging Jesus. They're pleading with Jesus, get rid of this woman. Please, Lord, remove her from the premises. We can't take this crying out anymore. So things aren't going well for this mother. She's faced with one obstacle after another. She's logistically outcast. She's spiritually downcast. She's confronted with this fact of being rejected and this fear of being removed from the premises. All she really wanted was to get some help for her daughter. But the only one who can help her seems that he doesn't care. He seems unconcerned and unmoved. And then, to add insult to injury, because of the disciples begging the Lord to get rid of her, she's now fearing that she's about to be physically removed from that place. Now, I, I want to say this to you today, that, that uh, you know, at this point, I mean, we can only imagine how she felt at that moment. She knew her only hope was Jesus. And now nothing's happening. So there are times when we have this happen. We have trouble. We have sadness. We have discouragement. And, and uh, we go to that special secret place to pray, to, to, to bear our soul to the Lord in prayer, and only to find him you know, what it looks like he's silent. Then to make matters worse, you might have things or people or situations that seem to try to remove you from even getting close to Jesus. You want to stay encouraged, but it's very hard because of what's happening here. So what do you do when that takes place? Well, some folks do, what they do is they quit. They just turn their back on the Lord. They stop coming to church. They don't live for Jesus. They become filled with anger and bitterness. And that is how a lot of people respond when they have trouble and they don't seem to be getting any answers from the Lord. But we can find the right way to respond by observing how this mom responded. And I want you to notice this here in closing. From a burdened mother's complication to a broken mother's frustration, there comes what I would call here a bold mother's determination. I like what the late preacher, a guy named Alexander McLaren, once said. Now, this guy lived back in the 1800s, early 1900s. 
but he was a great preacher, great author. He once said about, the, about this text, great faith does not give up, period. It is not deterred by obstacles or setbacks or disappointments. Great faith persists, it perseveres, and it pushes on. This mother seemed to have everything working against her. I mean, she's now down to her last resort. And I want you to notice what she does in spite of all these odds and all this opposition, all these obstacles. Look up to verse uh, 25 and notice what she does in response to everything that's going on. It says, then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. I mean, here's a lady that could not be deterred or denied. She was undaunted, unmoved. She was unshaken. She's persistent. We would say of her that she had a faith that just refused to let go. You get the idea here that as the disciples were trying to hush her up and get her out of the way, she would just cry out even louder. She refused to take no for an answer. Instead, here we find her falling at the Savior's feet, and she's worshiping him. What a tremendous response of a bold mother. She was bound and determined to get help from Jesus. Now, I want you to notice what happened here. First, there would be the position she was willing to assume. The disciples were trying to get her out of there, right? Wanted to get her removed. But here's Jesus' response in verse 24. Look at it in verse 24. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. This statement right here has sparked a lot of controversy over the year, uh, over the years among Christians and even those that study the Bible uh, carefully. But the statement here, I want you to understand something. It, this is not reflecting a lack of concern or a lack of compassion from Jesus. Rather, it is just simply outlining the focus of our Lord's initial ministry. And this is what we need to understand here. At this point, in biblical history, the primary ministry of Jesus was still, first of all, to the children of Israel. Okay? And, I mean, they were the children of the covenant. Even though the Jews were going to ultimately reject him, Jesus, nonetheless, as the Bible said, he first, he came unto his own. He first came unto his own. And, of course, we know that later on, his own received him not. But this statement of the, right here that Jesus is making uh, was showing that it was not yet time to move toward the Gentile people as a whole. And then in verse 26, it's almost like a shocking thing when Jesus goes on to say to her, uh, she's crying out for help. Look at verse 26. He answered and said, it's not meat or not fitting to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. Wow, that sounds pretty harsh on the surface, doesn't it? But here's the thing. We got to understand this. The words children and dogs were common terms back in this day. Tur children was a word that was used to refer to the Jews. They were the children of the covenant. Dogs, that was a, just simply a term that was used to speak of Gentiles, pagan Gentiles. So our Lord was saying to this woman that it wasn't fitting to take what belonged to the Jewish children and cast it to the Gentile dogs. So, if it wasn't hard enough to be faced with these obstacles, now here's this lady being described as a dog by Jesus. But even that could not keep her away. Look at what she says in verse 27. She replies here, and she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. In other words, here's this mom. She she's came to get what she needed for her daughter and she's willing to assume the position of a dog if she has to. So pride has been thrown out the window. This woman has faced rejection and silence, but if that, if that is what it took for her daughter to get, to get help for her great need, then to this mother it was worth it. And so she humbles herself before the Lord. By the way, that's what happens any, to any time anybody ever comes to Jesus for salvation. Pride has to be completely thrown out the window. You have to humble your heart before the Lord. Pride has been uh, something that, that uh, we know as you look about, about, around about it here. It's a terrible sin. I mean, think about this. What do we have to be proud of when it comes right down to it? Nothing. Okay. Where has our pride ever gotten us? 
nowhere. <laughs> but you know, pride has robbed many of spiritual blessings. Pride doesn't bring anyone closer to God. It just drives them farther away from God. The Bible says in James that God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. And so, here we go. Pride keeps a person from admitting their sin, from not submitting to the Lord. But here's this woman. She is desperate. So there is no room for pride at this point. And then I want you to notice something else here, her bold determination in the provision she was waiting to accept. She's, she's got this position. She's willing to assume that that's to be humble. And now there's this provision she's waiting to accept. When the Lord Jesus used the terminology of dogs, it's interesting to note the particular word that he chose. You see, in the New Testament, there are actually two different Greek words for that English word dog. One refers to these wild, mangy mongrels that would run in packs. I mean, they were, they were, they were like beasts, you know. They, would, they could be vicious, and, and they would live off of garbage and refuge. That's not the word Jesus used right here when speaking to this mother. He used another Greek word, kunarion, which speaks of a puppy or a house pet. So we got to understand that. The Lord Jesus was not demeaning her when he said that she was a Gentile dog. He's using a word to illustrate that she was a broken, pampered, and well-cared-for house pet. And this mother seemed to understand the difference between those two different words for dog. She understood what Jesus was saying, and that's why she's referring to the master's table. I mean, you would not ever find a mongrel, a wild dog, at the master's table, right? but you would find a house pet. So when the Lord Jesus referred to her race as a people as dogs, he was not ridiculing her. It was, it was actually a reality. It was a fact. Being a Gentile, a Canaanite, a pagan, a, an idolater, she and her entire race of people were referred to as dogs. But here she was, not like the wild dog. She was a broken, pampered, and well-cared-for house pet. And she picks up on that. And that's why she replies in verse 27, Truth, Lord, but the dogs eat of these crumbs which fall from their master's table. In other words, she knew who she was. She was a sinner. She was unworthy of anything that the Lord Jesus had to offer her. And yet she's willing to concede that she was less deserving than the children or the Jews, but she was willing to settle for the crumbs. Because even that would be good enough to meet her needs and her daughter's needs. Even a crumb, a tiny leftover from Jesus and his great power she knew could heal and would heal her daughter in a moment's time. And that was all she had ever asked for in the first place. That's why she was here. So here was a mom who wasn't too proud to beg, just like a dog, just to get a crumb that might fall from the master's table. So as a result of her humility... And her desperation and her looking to God for help, Jesus is moved to say to her, look at verse 28, he answered and said to her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Spurgeon said of this account, the Lord of glory surrendered to the faith of this woman. <laughs> she kept asking until she received. She kept seeking until she found. She kept knocking until the door was opened under her. Here was a woman who was out of options, right? She had turned her back on the false gods of her own people. She had placed her faith in the only God who could help her. And you know, folks, the Bible teaches us that that is how everyone who needs help, and I'm talking about spiritual help, uh, must come to Jesus. Honestly, we come to him humbly, desperately, wholeheartedly laying aside all of our pride, making no claims to entitlement, and making no demands, just realizing that they desperately need Jesus to save them. That's what it takes. And that's what happened here. And this type of faith and desperation caused God, Jesus, who is God, to say to her, great is your faith. Now, I believe that if we'll come to God the same way, even as a believer, okay, we've been saved, but even as a Christian, if we'll come to God, when we have a great need, or we have a family member that has a great need, and we come to the Lord with humility and brokenness and a broken heart, looking to Him for His help, 
we will not be denied. The psalmist said, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. If we are willing to assume the position of a dog, if we have to, and just beg God, we're going to discover the worst Jesus can give us is still far better uh, than the best we could ever do on our own or get from this wicked world. All we need, folks, is Jesus. He's more than enough for us. And you know, the thing is, one day the crumbs of the gospel did fall from the table of the Jews. They rejected Christ. And Paul, the great apostle Paul, would say, I I now turn to the Gentiles. And we were one of those in time, right? And, And so basically, the gospel fell from the table of Jews. It came and it fed poor, vile, sinful Gentile dogs like us with the bread of life. And if the Lord Jesus can take care of our greatest need with a crumb, don't you think he can certainly take care of any other need that we have in our life? You know he can, and he does. I read the story one time about a woman who went to a neighbor's produce stand to buy some grapes. So she put an order for grapes, and yet the farmer didn't fill the order right away. Now, there were plenty of grapes around, but he didn't fill her order, even though she was the next in line. He kind of went in the back and and um, he was, he was going to go back there, and, and, uh, and he, you know, so she kind of stood there and had to wait. Some other people came in front of her and got their grapes, and after a while, she was getting pretty upset about it. Finally, the farmer returned, her neighbor, with a basket full of these beautiful, perfectly ripened grapes. And he said to her, neighbor, I know I took a while, I kept you waiting, but I needed the time to get you the very best of my crop. <laughs> And you know, folks, that's the same thing that our dear Lord does for us. He does that for us. Jesus said this, for everyone that asks, receives. He said, how much more should your heavenly Father give good things to them that ask him? I I love that poem that says, you are coming to a king. Large petitions with you bring, for his grace and power are such, none can ever ask too much. Would to God. We'd had that same persistent faith that this mother had to pray for the needs of her daughter and her family. May we be burdened like she was. May we be broken over our children's needs, our grandchildren's needs. And then with a bold determination, come to the throne of grace and seek God's face as we intervene on our children and our grandchildren's behalf. And never give up until we get an answer from the Lord. May we today have a faith like this mother did, that just won't let go. And in the end, we're going to see the Lord Jesus come through for us. He's going to meet that need. He's going to get all the glory that he so richly deserves. Let's bow our heads together for a word of closing prayer. Gracious Father, we thank you so much on this special Mother's Day as we think about this one mother, Lord, and the the great burden on her soul. Lord, all the obstacles that she faced, and yet she knew the answer lied with Jesus. And only he could provide the help and meet the need that her daughter had. And Father, I pray we'll take this message to heart this morning. We'll apply it to our own hearts and lives. We have great needs in our families here today, Lord. You know that. You, you know every one of us in our situations. And there are many in our homes and our families that are not, still not saved, still outside the fold, still without hope, without God in this world. And Lord, our thoughts go to them today. I pray our hearts will go out that we'll pray to you for their soul salvation. That Lord God, you would meet the deepest need of their hearts. Help us never to give up, Lord, until we see an answer from you from heaven. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You've been listening to Al Rudy, Senior Pastor at Faith Baptist Church in Danville, Illinois. If you'd like to learn more, visit our website, faithdanville.org. That's faithdanville.org. Thank you for listening.